I think because of the fallibility of humans, even though they are saints, is that it's very easy for those of us who are one of them, brothers and sisters of the Lord, because of our common associations one with another, to forget about the church being a divine institution and every member of it then making up that divine institution. If you turn to the Ephesian epistle, you will find that whole letter deals with the church. It has been called the church epistle, yea, a, the great church epistle. And it is a tremendous treatise as far as any one letter of the New Testament concerning the church of Christ. And it's in that book that you find the inspired Apostle Paul affirming that the church is a manifestation of God's wisdom. Thus, if you are a member of the Lord's church, you are a part of that which is God's wisdom. If you look in Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 10, then going through 11, Paul wrote, Concerning the church, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I will add verse 12 to that, for he speaks of each member of the church when he says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. In the mind of deity, there's always been then the church because deity is omniscient. He is not, of course, controlled or limited by time and space. He created time and space. We cannot begin to comprehend what it's like to exist where there is no time, where there is no material thing, there is no space. Because all that is in eternity, as far as where God resides, is beyond anything we see and can experience through the five senses. So it does a little good to try to understand that with the finite minds that we have. But it does indicate that we can accept the fact of inspired writ about it. And we can understand that God in His glory in heaven before time was had in His mind the idea of the church. I'm quite confident in view of what I do know from God's revelation about the church that those of us who reach glory someday will be able to see even then things that are completely hidden from us now as to the wisdom of God in all ages to do what He is doing even now in the church while we labor to be faithful on earth. So the church is a manifestation of the divine wisdom. Well, that also means then that if the church as a whole is a manifestation of God's wisdom, then every component part of the church is a part of that wisdom. And that comes down, and I told you this morning that we would, the Lord willing, engage in this this afternoon, that the organization of the church is a manifestation of the wisdom of the Almighty. I need not tell all of you who are old enough to understand that when you study your New Testament that you find that God has organized the church on the local level. There's no larger or smaller entity, organized entity, of the one church that Jesus built except a church like here or in Corinth or in Jerusalem or some other part of the world. So the one church to which all are added when they obey the gospel is organized in various geographic locations. It would be impossible for every member of the church to gather in one place to worship God on the first day of the week. 
But, of course, every congregation of God's people can. And thus he organizes the one church on what we would say is the local level. Therefore, the elders come out of the local church, the deacons come out of the local church, and so on. But we must realize, lest these things become so commonplace to us, realize we would know a thing about these. We wouldn't even see the importance of them. Except from the mind of the Almighty, He's revealed it to us concerning the government of the church. Thus, when you look at the eldership, you see a display of divine wisdom. Now, somebody will automatically begin to think, well, I've known of elders who didn't do this and didn't do that or did this and then did that, which the Bible told them not to, and I've known of bad elders. Well, you know, in that case, I just wouldn't believe in Jesus Christ because he chose one of his apostles and he turned out to be a devil. Because everybody has free will. They can freely, humbly, from the heart, choose on the basis of evidence what they ought to do to be saved or they can reject it. And like many in the church of Corinth, once they become Christians, they can be so self-willed and determined to do things their way according to human lusts that they mess everything up. And it would take then a divine letter to correct them on their mistakes. So as far as the world is concerned, the church in the world is the way God intended it, but we should not as members of the church let the members who are unfaithful in the church cause us to reject the divine and wise plan of the Almighty. You can see this in families. Families are the smallest unit of society. Yet, the family's certainly fallen on hard times. But for those of us who believe that God established marriage in the home for the good of man and tells about the responsibilities of the husband and wife and father and mother and the children and all to one another, still call men back to the Bible as God's Word to be what we ought to be. God never said when everybody that obeys the when somebody obeys the gospel, however many that may be, that they will always be faithful in everything. If he knew that was going to be the case, why is there a second law of pardon? Why is there a need for people to repent who are members of the church? Well, it's obvious then that people can make mistakes, people can sin in the church. So when people start pointing to the eldership or to the deacons or to the preacher or to the Bible class teachers and say, well, so-and-so and such-and-such, and I just don't like it that way. You might as well just go with the denominations and not like a lot of other things about the church and still think God's going to be happy with you. So the eldership is a part of that eternal plan that was in the mind of God concerning the church, just as much as the deacons are and the preachers and the teachers and so forth. Understanding the divine wisdom regarding then the organization of the church and the elders will enhance our understanding of the need for an eldership. And thus, we'll see the need of working to qualify. It's always amazing to me that people say, well, you know, this guy over here turned out not to be qualified or if he ever was, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, you can say the same thing about any member of the church. A person may very well from the heart obey the gospel, live faithful for a time. But then they can transgress too. It doesn't stop us from returning to the blueprint that is divine for the church and thus every component part as a part of the wisdom of God. If people want to be elders, then let them so live their lives that they can be. There needs to be teaching of what the Bible says about how to qualify to be an elder and what the work of elders would be. I'm quite sure, after all these years, that I've experienced elders who were not what they ought to be, and you could have taken a sledgehammer and upside the head, and they would then be adult elders who were not what they should be before they were not adult elders who were not what they should be. But then I can say that regarding the preachers and 
and teachers. Some husbands and wives seem to be pretty addled too. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to keep pleading for people to straighten their lives up and do what God said. And when they see they're wrong, repent and pull themselves back to the truth. Because each individual Christian is the only one that can do that. The rest can set godly examples. And they can preach the word and reprove and rebuke and exhort their brethren to do what's right. But nevertheless, are we going to throw out the baby with the bathwater? Simply because... Somebody didn't do whatever we thought they should. So we need to esteem the eldership. I've worked with, I have to stop and count for a moment with I don't know how many elders over the years. And because of the nature of the preacher's work, being called in many times to sit with the elders. Thus I've been exposed from almost my teens to elders meetings and dealings that they've had with many different elderships. So I think I know a little bit whereof I speak. God is my witness. A study like this also should cause every elder to think more highly of his work. Uh, is he taking enough time to really shepherd the flock? Is he concerned about the souls under his oversight? You know, we find time to do all sorts of other things. Do we then give the, the crumbs back? Uh, you know, we got time to go do this, that, and the other and involve ourselves in this, that, and the other. But... Not much time to spend dealing with the members of the church. And, you know, that does have to do with whether you go to heaven or hell. So we need to see the importance of fulfilling these responsibilities when it comes to elders being what God says they ought to be. We could have, we could have uh, said concerning the elderships what we did about the home this past week. The home is God would have it. Well, elderships is God would have them. Gospel preachers as God would have them. Deacons as God would have them. Husbands and fathers as God would have them. Wives and mothers as God would have them. So that all works. Are you a Christian like the Apostle Paul was a Christian? That is using your talents according to your abilities and knowledge of the truth to be dedicated to him on the basis of Matthew 6.33. It's a serious responsibility to watch for the souls of the flock. And elders have a serious responsibility to protect the church. I, I really wonder sometimes what members think if you just said, would you tell us what you think elders ought to be doing regarding you? I think you might tell them what they ought to be doing regarding somebody else. But what should elders be doing regarding you to protect your soul? To guide you and direct you. Nothing probably. Leave me alone and let me do as I please. That's the American way. <laughs> but that, that way is going to leave many people to perdition. I think it should be a foregone conclusion that human wisdom did not originate. The prudent concept of how the church was to be overseen. If you had left it up to man without the revelation of God. To say, all right, here's the church. Everybody that obeys the gospel, the Lord adds to it. Now you figure out how you're going to run the show. Well, I think you have really a pretty good view of the matter. Just look what the denominations have done. who would give no respect to the authority of the scriptures. And look what Roman Catholicism did. You'll pretty much find out that it comes right down even where there's a plurality of whatever they might call them that would be over the church, in one way or the other, if you look at denominationalism, it usually comes back to one man rule. One man determines it. Now, others have influential parts in it. And, of course, if you get into the clergy concept of denominationalism, I think which is best seen in Roman Catholicism nowadays, rather than in the Protestant so-called denominations, then... Uh, you see that people, well, you might have a priest, and then you might have a moan senior, and then you might you have an archbishop, and then you can have a or a bishop, and then an archbishop, and then a cardinal. And, you know, if you keep moving your players on the chessboard right, you can get to be the pope, providing you're from a third world country or an Italian. <laughs> 
to a great extent, that's exactly where it works. Because people who are left to themselves are going to do as they think. They don't have the revelation of God to guide them. Think about the popular vote that goes on. Think about one man rule some way or the other. All that comes from the mind of men without respect for the revelation of God and the Word of God. And it's significant that the initial departure that human wisdom practiced was literally a desertion from the divine blueprint concerning the eldership. We often point out in the Jewel Miller film strip back in the 50s, it was used so much, would point out that by the year 150, then you had one man in the eldership who had more power than the rest. Then in time, the word bishop was applied to him, and the elders then were under him. I've always found it interesting that Constantine would say, look, we got all these different doctrines going on in the church. So you bishops, metropolitan bishops, bishops over a given diocese, I'm calling all of you together, and you're going to come up with that which is a final authority on what a Christian really is. Now, they had had the New Testament for a long time, but you'll notice that was insufficient. They were coming together to vote on whatever they considered to be doctrine that one must believe. Uh, you can have all sorts of things happen when it's left up to man. Uh, you may have, as I said, a head elder or elder over area heads of calling him a bishop. Even change the words of the Bible to make it more important when bishop and uh, presbyter are all the same things. Poor main, they're all referring to the same men in the office. So people tamper with the divine blueprint regarding the government of the church, just like they do the whole church. And finally, out of the great apostasy, their former Roman Catholicism, and in 606 there was a pope, and everybody who was anything to those people referred to him as Holy Father. They do that even in spite of Jesus' clear teaching in Matthew 23, 8 through 12, where he condemns religious titles that exalt the man. I think sometimes my own brethren need to read that and believe it, the way we like to elevate people. I noticed the other day, and I've known this fellow for years and years. And so now he's going to speak to the commencement of a preacher's training school, and Dr. So-and-so is going to be preaching. What is that to a teaching of the Bible and God's Word? In an academic sense, that might be very well I like to know what that has to do with anything. It says, I know more Bible than you do. And, of course, it doesn't say what his doctorate's in. It may be in snow shoveling. I don't know. So you watch men. They'll glorify themselves. Men left to himself glorify himself. There's nothing further removed from the New Testament truth than the authoritative organization that is seen in the denominational world, which has no elders as the Bible describes them. It's usually run by the preacher who's called a pastor, and usually that's from the idea of the board of deacons, so they use the word deacons wrong, and they appoint the pastor about like some uh, board appoints the CEO of a company. And uh, he's expected to run that church just like a CEO. And, uh, you know, if he doesn't accomplish all, then the board can remove it and get another CEO, this kind of thing. Or you got some synod or conference or whatever. Now, the New Testament's been there all along, folks. There's been the divine, infallible pattern. How to become a Christian, how to live the Christian life, the organization, work, and worship, the destiny of the church. You know, we often talk about the church being autonomous. I had occasion last week to point that out. We received uh, a question about a church in California. I didn't know anything about that church in California. And they wanted to know if we as the Church of Christ could speak for that church in California. Well, you know, when, you, when I read something like that, I said, where do I begin about the church? But I gave, I think, a pretty good response to it regarding what the church is and the autonomy of the church. 
Well, I think it's Leroy Brownlow in his book dealing with the uh, Wyoming Church of Christ that points out autonomy is like a big window. Now, if you've got just one pane of glass making up that window, a rock through it destroys the whole plane. But when you have that same area covered by multiplicity of glass panes, each one set apart from the other, a rock through it knocks that one out, but it doesn't disturb the rest of them. So under King Jesus, as he rules in his New Testament, and the church is organized as he would have it organized, then each church takes care of its own business. And if the church down the road decides to apostatize, that does not necessarily mean that we will. We don't have to. We run the business of the church here at Spring, or wherever the congregation might be when it's fully organized. And so we handle our own affairs. You can see then in a plurality of elders that they benefit from one another. At least they should. They operate under the chief shepherd. They're sharply aware, keenly aware of they operate under the chief shepherd and they must give an account then to the chief shepherd someday for the souls that they oversee. It's very easy to become complacent and people slip slide away and you don't even notice it. But because that happens doesn't mean that it should and that it can't be corrected. If you look at Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Scripture says, And hath put all things under his feet, that's Christ's feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And there's a multiplicity of members of one body. In calling those who would be the ambassadors of the court of heaven, the apostles of Christ, he chose 12 and didn't just use one. And, and yet they would all be baptized in the Holy Spirit and have direct guidance from God to call to remembrance everything Jesus had taught and anything else he would reveal. If somebody said uh, they not only could preach the word, they could write the New Testament. And you know what? They wrote the New Testament. The Apostles' Doctrine is the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Now, if I'd been left up to men, I know what they would have done. Because they've already done it in teaching. The Roman Catholic Church knows there were those 12 apostles. Well, what do they say about Peter? He's the chief on show. They say, in their terms, he's the prince of the apostles. And that caused a big blow up even among the Catholics back ages ago. It caused the Eastern Orthodox to come to existence, the Roman Catholic Church. Because they demanded that since Rome was, uh, as they say, the Holy See, because that's where Peter was, and he's the prince of the apostles, then everybody's got to do homage to the Pope in Rome. And there's a bunch of folks that wouldn't do it, even though they were Catholics. And so the Eastern Orthodox Church came into existence. And Roman Catholicism came into existence. Well, the Bible doesn't hint at such a doctrine. There's not one shred of evidence that Peter was the first pope, as a matter of fact, that he was ever in Rome. In fact, all of the evidence points to the contrary. <laughs> that is, that he was a pope of any kind. In every instance in the New Testament where elders are mentioned, it always speaks in the plural. It needs to be said also that when elders come to agreement, then every individual elder is subject to the eldership's agreement, just like everybody else is in the church they oversee. You come together and you have an agreement, and then later somebody says, well, let, well, wait a minute. No, the agreement's been made. Now, do you expect the church to submit to the collective decision of the eldership, and you not? Something's kind of wrong. Acts 14, 23 means that there's a plurality of elders. Paul addresses the elders in Philippi. He doesn't address the elder. Paul sought to meet the elders in Ephesus. Not the one single solitary elder, Acts 20, 17, nor the most influential person in the church, nor the, nor the widow with all the money that controls everything. Nothing like that. He asked for the plurality of elders, those serving in that capacity of the church in Ephesus, to meet him. And he gave commandments to them because they are the ones that guide and direct and superintend the church. I often tell people and have for more years than I can remember and don't remember when I first started telling them. If you want to know what a church believes, don't go ask the preacher nor anybody else that's been a member there for 40 years. Ask the elders. 
and you'll find out. If they will tell you, of course. Sometimes I find out elders, uh, they really don't want people to know. And I've asked a few of them a number of things and am in the process of asking some more. <laughs> Such concepts as the elder or the bishop came years after the apostles of Jesus Christ died. And there's not one scripture that authorizes having just one elder. And there's not any faithful elder who understands his job that's going to try to exercise his dominion over the other elders, whether it's passive or whether it's not. Uh, that's just not authorized by the Bible. That's sin to do such. So it's only when an elder speaks with his fellow elders and they all collectively have made a decision that that's binding on everybody. That doesn't mean that sometime later on circumstances can't change where you where you have to go back and change things. I've been in congregations that had a radio program and it cost so much money that uh, finally the people moved away or whatever and the contribution was down and the elders elected not to continue the radio program as they did certain other things. Well, they're the ones supposed to do such things as that. So what they decided one time to do, now they decide not to do on the basis of practical matters that have to do with anything a church would do. So there's no authority in one elder apart from the others. I remember Brother, this was, probably, this was over 40 years ago, Brother Franklin Camp told about a place he moved, and he said he met the elders, and they worked out the agreement. What the elders all agreed, this would be his duty. He said he hadn't been there a month. One elder came up and started outlining all these things he's supposed to do as a preacher. He said, we had this worked out when I came here. and says, is this just you, or is it the eldership? Well, he admitted it was just him, and he said, well, then it's not going to be done unless the eldership decides it. And if the eldership decides it, then that's against what we decided back earlier. And it makes no sense, or I wouldn't come here for that, so you can find yourself another preacher. Well, elders do have to be honest, you know. They really do. They have to be honest like everybody else, and they have to follow the golden rule. They have to be concerned about the church they're overseeing. In fact, the plurality of elders works as a check and balance system. One man may not see or realize something that another one does. Has that ever been in anything? Well, of course it has been in business. Uh, are you aware of this? I've seen situations where something started being talked about in the elders, and as it started being talked about, uh, one speaks up, well, are you aware that this took place? Well, no, I didn't. That changes the whole tune. <laughs> well, that's what it's all about. That's what it takes to be elders, to see that the church does what God obligates it to and nothing else, and to get those obligations discharged the quickest and best way possible. And yes, sometimes God leaders go astray. Paul warned that of the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, 28 through 29. He even said that from among your own selves shall men arise, teaching first things to draw away disciples after them. I think we want to reach a stage, whether it's elders or preachers or deacons or whoever in the church, that we don't have to be vigilant anymore. You just put somebody in, and he's such a fine person, his knowledge and practice of the truth, you just let it go. Well, okay, bring me your Bible and show me that. I do find many scriptures that say things like, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. There's always been people who started out right, and for one reason or the other, they went wrong. You think it'll ever get on this earth where it's not that way, even in the church? So there's always the need for vigilance and examination. First of all, for what we ought to be, we're doing that to ourselves. But the elders must be mindful of that in the church. They must know what's being taught. They must know what kind of lives the teachers are living. You know, it does not, listen to me, it doesn't take long to see a cooperative effort in, the, in, in, in members or to see one that's not so cooperative. And that's very important to understand. It's not hard to see the attitude that says, here my Lord send me, I'm ready to do whatever work I can, I want you brethren to know that. And then to see the attitude that says, I'll do it if you let me do it like I want to do it, other than that, don't ask me. Which one of those do you think, that attitude, which one of those attitudes do you think is taught by the Bible? Also, and we'll close out on this one, the wisdom of mature men in the eldership. The Lord knew that a novice 
in the faith was not proper material out of which to compose an efficient leadership. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6. Of course, when you have no elders and the church is run by general men's business meeting, then you've got some with little maturity as a Christian, with as much say-so as those who are wise in the faith. And so many times those kind of meetings become a three-ring circus. It's easy to see that a new convert would not be as wise in the scriptures and the dealings of the church as one who has had years of practice and prove themselves. If you look at the qualification of deacons, have you noticed that before you appoint a deacon, he must first be proved? In other words, he's already doing the work of a deacon. He's proving it. Now he can be appointed to the office of deacon. Have you ever looked at that and seen it? That's in God's divine plan. He doesn't want to mess with it either. Some churches have ignored this and upon receiving outstanding business or professional men in the church, they immediately say, well, they'd be good for the eldership. Well, everybody's a good businessman is not good for the eldership. The church is not a business like a corporation. It exists for one reason and one reason only. Can you guess what it is? To make money. That's the only reason a corporation exists is to make money. And they don't care what it does to the person they fire. If you don't fit into that scheme of things, out you will go, though you've been there 25, 30 years doing a great job. Just let it slip up one time. And if it throws a monkey wrench in the money business, you're gone. That's just the way it works. And the church is not like that. A man needs maturity and spiritual growth before he's to be considered for this vital post of duty. And it is. Experience, Bible knowledge, Things that just cannot be in younger people because they haven't lived life long enough. It's not accidental. And now think about this. This is not even in the realm of spiritual things. And if they can think this way, surely godly people in the church ought to think this way. But it's not accidental that our founding fathers in the United States made it constitutionally impossible for a teenager or a man in his 20s, chronologically speaking, to be a senator or president. Now I tell you, if people... And politics can think that way. What about the blessed of the earth, the elect, the children of God, the members of the body of Christ? Well, I realize youth in many ways has a lot of things going for them. Now listen. But wisdom and experience is not one of them. That comes with years. The wisdom of our being under shepherds is seen, as I've already said, we are accountable to the chief shepherd whose church, who uh, owns this church, who bought it with his blood. And we should therefore be mindful of that. I'm not going to say any more because you really already know what it is. But think about it when it's applied then to this congregation and your life here. One of the things that ought to be understood is that if elders are what they ought to be, and that's what we want, I think, is that they're going to help keep each other like we ought to be. I'd hate to know that you can't depend on <laughs> your fellow elders to help you be what you ought to be. <laughs> Seems to me that would be one of the places you would go to first to find the, what you need to know. So I hope we'll realize as I started out that the church is in the divine, is in the divine plan and every component part of it is in the divine plan. Thus, elders, preachers of the gospel, deacons, and Bible school teachers all fit in the divine plan. And I hope you'll apply it personally to your life so things can be done as God intended and decently and in order. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we plead with you to consider the importance of becoming one, to be saved from your sins, to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of sins. As a child of God, when you sin, then know there's a second law of pardon, repentance and confession of sins and prayer to God for forgiveness. If you're subject, therefore, to the gospel invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.